All right, so graphic design for non-graphic designers. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, although, uh, you know, what we do at eLearning Uncovered and Artists in eLearning is focused on eLearning. Graphic design is a very big part of what it is that we do um, in the world of eLearning. Whether you are a classroom trainer or you do eLearning or whatever it is you do, graphic design is a big part of it. And this is one of my favorite topics to talk about because I think um, I think it's more important than we usually give it credit for. Graphic design is a huge part of what we do when we create e-learning content. Um, and so we're talking about graphic design for non-graphic designers. Now, whenever I talk about this topic, graphic design for non-graphic designers, I always like to go back to the very, 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 very first thing I ever created that I would say fits into the category of graphic design. And I always like to look back at how awful it was so I can see how far I've come. And uh, this was the very first thing I've ever created, or I ever created, that, I don't know, I guess kind of fits in that realm of graphic design. And at the time, I was working, this was probably, um, I can tell you when this was, this was probably back in 2007, I was working in retail loss prevention um, at Kohl's Department Stores, catching shoplifters, and um, which is quite surprising because I, I have a degree in criminal justice and that, that's my background, but I made the transition into e-learning, long story, but I did. And uh, and this was a poster that I created that was hung up in the break room to help uh, encourage store employees or store associates to call loss prevention when they see um, suspicious behavior. And at the time, I thought this was just beautiful. Uh, this was an amazing, amazing poster. I was so proud of it. And now when I look back on it retrospectively, yeah, you know what? It's not beautiful. <laughs> it's not beautiful at all. In fact, it's it's crowded and it's it's using all sorts of fonts and it's using word art and I'm using a clip art image and I'm using different fonts and I'm sure it's littered with spelling errors and I'm, you know, it's bold and italicized and the bullets are all funky and it's awful. Um, but I like looking at this because it really helps me understand uh, where I came from and and, and uh, how I got there. And um, I had the fortunate opportunity a couple years, if I fast forward to maybe 2009, 2010, uh, to redo that poster. Um, and uh, you can see here that, that the, the, the revised version of that poster was on the left here. And, and again, I thought this was just fantastic. As you can see, I clearly I discovered the use of color and uh, shapes and all sorts of other graphics. And at the time, again, I thought this was amazing. And I think I also had a big obsession with uh, drop shadows because I think there's a drop shadow on every single thing in this document. And, uh, and again, looking at this retrospectively, it's crowded and there's too much happening and, and, and your eyes don't know where to focus on this document. And I, again, I love looking at this because, you know, you can see I had some potential for graphic design, but I just was using it all wrong and it was just doing too much. And then the one on the right is another poster that was done for something else. Um, but, but the one on the, the left is, is the one that I, I always get a kick out of it because it's there's potential there, but it's really bad. It's a really bad example of graphic design. So we're going to be talking about that a little bit. We're talking about graphic design for non-graphic designers and whether you create presentations, whether you create e-learning courses, whether you create um, print materials or documents or whatever it is. Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about, I think, can help uh, can help you in many different ways. And we're really not talking about graphic design. I'm really talking about visual communications and there's a big difference between graphic design and visual communications. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that once we uh, dig in a little deeper. So I'm curious to know, I, I'd love to know from your perspective, um, if you don't mind taking a few minutes in, in chat and tell me why is it that graphic design is so hard for you? If graphic design is something you struggle with, tell me why in chat. Why is it something you struggle with? If you don't mind taking a few minutes to type something in chat. And the chat window is in the left-hand side of the Adobe Connect window underneath the participant panel. Right, and so Alyssa says designer's block sets in when you're looking at a blank white slide. Yes, I completely agree. 
Jerry says, feels time consuming when there's too much to say with limited space. I agree with that. A few more people are typing, so I'll give you guys a few more moments. Kelly says, I'm not creative in designing fun and attractive slides. Muhammad says, I always linked it to Adobe Photoshop and complicated software. Not sure what should be emphasized. I agree with all those statements. See what Ashley says. And Ashley agrees with Alyssa. Also wonder what will be the most visually appealing and what will catch everyone's attention the most. But not in a distracting way. Those are all fantastic and I'm going to talk a little about, about all of those. So graphic design is hard um, for many different reasons and and it's not like uh, it's not like, I don't know, learning to drive stick shift, for example, is hard for people because I think we all struggle with the mechanics of it. But graphic design is hard for people for different reasons. Some of us are just don't feel creative. Some of us are intimidated by the tools. Uh, it might be some other reason. Graphic design is hard for some people for so many different reasons, and that's why it's such a struggle to help people be better graphic designers because what makes it hard for you is what makes makes it hard for somebody else, you know? So I have a few theories on why I think graphic design is hard. Um, first off, uh, you know, how many of us really grew up of being graphic designers? None of us <laughs> grew up of dreaming to be graphic designers, and in fact, none of us grew up dreaming to be e-learning designers or trainers or anything like that. Um, you know, the, the concept of e-learning for many of us, including myself, e-learning wasn't even a thing when I was a kid. And so I didn't even, I couldn't even dream of being that. Even graphic design. Graphic design was very different when I was a child than it is today. And so part of the issue is, is we don't dream of being that when we grow up. Um, you know, for me, I wanted to be like an astronaut or a lawyer and I wanted to be an architect and all these other things. But graphic designer or e-learning designer was not on that list. Um, so you don't grow up of dreaming to be that. I think that's the first hurdle. The second hurdle, and I think um, uh, Alyssa, you'll be able to relate to this one because you kind of mentioned this. Um, you know, when you look at this slide, this is, this is what you see when you first open up PowerPoint, right? And usually PowerPoint's a, a common tool that we all use. And when you open it up, you get this blank slide and these placeholders. And I kind of feel like one of the reasons we struggle with graphic design is because I think the tools we use tend to set us up for failure. And what I mean by that is we look at this as a blank slide and we see those, those placeholders and we feel like those are the restrictions that we have to work with. Um, and uh, the tools don't really set us up for success. And then if you were to start adding content, if you were to start doing content slides, you know, what does it encourage you to do? It encourages you to create bullet points. And so the tools that we use can set us up for failure. Now what I will say though is when you look at this, there's two different ways people look at this. People, Some people look at this as the restrictions they have to work with. They have to use these placeholders and those text, you know, the, that, that font that's on the screen. But other people, people who are more inclined to be graphic designers, look at it as a blank canvas, as, as a way for me to create anything I can imagine. And that's what I would challenge you to do when you look at some of these tools, whether it be PowerPoint or Articulate Storyline or a different tool that you use, look at it as a blank canvas to create whatever you want. But I think sometimes the tools can set us up for failure, either because um, they're complicated to use or they don't set us up for success. The other reason, and this one is, is strictly my opinion, um, and you can disagree with me. I encourage, if you disagree, please let me know. But one of the reasons I think we struggle with being graphic designers is I think um, especially in recent years, I think our school system has really beaten out any sort of creative thinking <laughs> out of students. Um, and I think it's getting worse. And the reason why I say that is, you know, so many of our schools, they have to follow these really stringent testing standards. And what happens is you end up not teaching students how to think creatively, you teach students how to answer quiz questions and pass exams. And, uh, you know, when I was in high school, um, I was allowed to take all sorts of electives. I was able to take a theater class or an art class. Um, and I was allowed to take those as part of my regular curriculum. And we had a full theater department and music department, all sorts of stuff. 
However, my brother, uh, he's 10 years younger than me, and when he was in high school, and he graduated in 2012, when he was in high school, any of those programs, whether it be culinary arts, whether it be uh, theater, art, any of that, it was all after school, and it was optional, and it was taught by volunteers, and it was like 30 minutes a week. And uh, so I think there's something with the way our school systems have um, turned our students into test takers, not creative thinkers. Okay, And that's, again, just my opinion. You might disagree. And oftentimes it depends on your district. <laughs> Some school districts do fund that, those programs, others don't. The other reason I think graphic design is hard for some people is some of us are just not wired to be graphic designers. There's this whole theory of the left brain, right brain um, mentality where people say if you are a right, right brained person, uh, you tend to be left handed and you tend to be more creative. Whereas if you're a left brained person, you tend to be more analytical and you tend to be right handed. Now, uh, I tend to, I'm very creative and I happen to be left handed. Does that mean I'm a right brained person? I don't know. And for many of you who consider yourself analytical, you're probably right-handed and you you might be considered a left-brained person. Um, so I don't know whether that's true or not, or if there's any real science behind that. But I do think at its core, I do think some of us are wired to be creative thinkers and some of us were more analytical. We think black and white. We think in words, um, not in colors and shapes and, uh, you know visually. Some of us are, are non-visual thinkers. And that's a that's a roadblock for many people. The other reason is I think graphic design, I was saying this earlier, graphic design is hard for people for different reasons, right? And if you think about the difference between content design, whether it be instructional design or just writing or anything, compared to graphic design, you know, you think about content design, if you're writing something, it's either a complete sentence or it's not a complete sentence. Either you use that comma correctly or you didn't use it correctly. Um, it's more black and white. Whereas with graphic design, graphic design, there is no right or wrong, really. Uh, usually it depends on your intent, but there's so many other things you have to take into account, whether it's the voice, the color, the layout, the shape, the size, proportion, repetition, animation, alignment, imagery, font. Rhythm, line, shapes, concepts, contrast. There's so many other things you have to take into account. And, and the balance between all of those things matter. And, um, you know, just changing one little thing can make the whole thing unbalanced. And all of a sudden it looks bad. Um, and just by changing simple things can make it look good. And so graphic design conceptually is harder for people to really uh, quantify whether something is right or wrong. We can usually look at something and go, yep, that looks good. Or, nope, that doesn't look good. But the problem is it's hard sometimes for us to put our finger on why it doesn't look good or why it does look good. Whereas with content design, design you can go, yeah, that sentence is not a complete sentence. And that's it. It's right or wrong. Graphic design, mm, it's a little bit more fluid. Now, um, the big question is, well, how can you become a better graphic designer? How can you become a better graphic designer? And the truth is, I don't know. I really don't know how you, as an individual, can become a better graphic designer. It's how do you teach somebody to be an artist? I don't know how you do that. Um, it's one of those things that I've struggled with trying to answer is how does anyone become better graphic designer? Um, I can teach somebody to write better or to use grammar better, but to teach somebody to be creative, I don't know if that's possible. Um, and the reason why that is is because, like I said, the reason why you struggle with graphic design compared to somebody else is completely unique to you. And the, the journey that you are going to take as an individual to become a better graphic designer or visual communicator is unique to you. Um, and so although I can't answer how you as an individual can become a better graphic designer, I can share with you some best practices and some tips that can help lead you in the right direction to create, to, into creating better looking content. And that's really what we're focusing on today. And going back to what I said earlier, there's a big difference between um, graphic design and what I'm really talking about, which is visual communications. Think about graphic design and it's kind of like the animal, animal kingdom. There's all sorts of subcategories of graphic design. Um, you, you know, some people think um, graphic design is still very artistic. You know, you have, think about like the new iPads, the new iPad Pros, where they have those, um, those styluses where people use it to create art. Well, I guess that's technically graphic design. Um, you think about computer-generated imagery, like what you see in a Pixar movie. 
That's computer generated imagery, imagery, but it is graphic design. What we're talking about today is visual communications. How can you make your content more visual and, and follow some better best practices to make it easier for your learners or your audience to absorb what it is that you're saying? Um, and that's really what we're focusing on is visual communications in the realm of graphic design, of course. So why does graphic design matter? That's the next question I want to answer. Why does graphic design matter? And let me tell you a story. Um, I mentioned earlier that before I got into e-learning, I used to work in retail loss prevention. And uh, this is going to be a really weird analogy, but you have to trust me as your fearless presenter um, with this analogy. But when I, when I worked in retail loss prevention, one of the things I discovered, well, first off, I have to say I, I loved catching shoplifters. Catching shoplifters is, is really one of the funnest jobs ever. Um, it's incredibly adrenaline rushing. I loved it. Um, I loved it so much, in fact, that I would actually get angry and frustrated when somebody would grab a piece of merchandise and go to the register and pay for it. I really wanted people to steal it so I could catch them. It was a lot of fun. Um, but what I realized is that, is that in order for a shoplifter to accomplish their goal, that is to steal something, um, I had to be almost invisible to them, right? And... And if they didn't, if they didn't know that I was there, they would feel comfortable shoplifting. But the moment they knew my presence was there, it would make them obviously. It would deter them from from their goal, which was to shoplift. So I realized I had to make myself invisible to the shoplifter. And graphic design is very similar in the sense that you have to make yourself invisible. You have to make your graphic design almost almost peripheral to what it is you want the user to focus on. Graphic design is meant to elevate your content, not distract from it. And here's a great example. The graphic design in this, in this example, this poster that I created a long time ago, the graphic design in this poster is distracting you from the content. I realized, retrospectively, that this poster was incredibly ineffective because it distracted people from what it is that I wanted them to do, which was to read the content. Um, and so graphic design has to be very, very uh, subtle in the way that you apply it to create really effective visual communications. And one of the things, this is another example, one of the things I tell people is you really want the user to be able to access your content, right? You want them to almost be able to touch your content. But when you have bad graphic design, this is what you do. You almost make the content inaccessible or you blur it out with all of your bad graphic design. And that's that's why graphic design matters, because it can either elevate or distract from your content. And you never want it to distract from your content. And what this really comes down to is the concept of signal versus noise. All right? When you look at a, uh, something that's really well designed, there is no doubting what the signal is, what it is that it's trying to get you to do or understand or communicate to you. However, if you go back to my previous example that I was showing you earlier with that poster, you can also have a lot of noise. And noise is that stuff that distracts your audience from, from whatever it is you want them to do or absorb or learn from your content. All right, so look at these. Yeah, we have a lot of noise happening here. There's no doubting that. Here's another example I like to show. And this one I find completely ironic. Um, this, these two images here are slides um, from a presentation that the former CEO of Microsoft, I can't remember his name, it's not Bill, it's the one after Bill Gates, but, but, but before the current CEO, I always forget his name, Steve Ballmer is his name, that's what it is. This is a presentation Steve Ballmer, the former CEO of Microsoft, gave at a very big conference of his. And I find it so ironic because Steve Ballmer, the CEO, the former CEO of Microsoft, who is the creator, Microsoft is the creator of PowerPoint, uh, created these awful slides with his own product. <laughs> Why would anyone want to create presentations with that product when this is what you create, these awful slides? I find that so ironic. And so, you know, this is just a lot of noise. It's not a lot of signal. It's a lot of noise. Um, it's, it's hard to interpret what we see here. Here's another really great example. This one was, um, this one was presented. It was from a consulting firm presented to, uh, uh, one of our military divisions, I don't know if it was the Navy or the Army or, or whoever, but it was presented to our military about the strategy 
that uh, uh, what needs to happen in Afghanistan in order for us to win or in order to exit the war in Afghanistan. And again, this is besides it being incredibly over overly overly complicated, it's just a lot of noise. Like, how can you even? Where do you even begin looking at this? This is just awful in terms of um, in terms of content. <laughs> and the funny thing is, if you look down here, it's version three. They're working draft. I love that. Um, and apparently this means significant delays. I just think it's just hilarious. It's an awful, awful, awful image. Um, <clears throat> if anything, I will say this, though. If anything, it does communicate how complicated the war in Afghanistan is uh, uh, for the U.S. So um, let me talk about a couple things about what graphic design is not and what we're not talking about. Um, you know, graphic design and visual communications is not about adding clip art to jazz it up. I see, I see this and hear this all the time when you have somebody say, hey, can we just add an image to just jazz it up? Can we add some clip art in that empty space to fill it up and jazz it up? No, that's not what we're doing. That's not what visual communications is about. It's not about filling empty space with a meaningless graphic to jazz it up or to make it feel balanced. That's not what we're talking about. Uh, graphic design is also not adding stock photos of non-specific people having non-specific meetings in non-specific locations. Again, when you do visual communications, everything has to have a meaning and intent behind it. We're not adding images just to fill up some space. We're adding images because there's some intent or some meaning to that image and to the content that's next to it. All right. Um, graphic design is not using Comic Sans to make your document look fun. Um, Comic Sans is a, a font that I'm sure many of you are aware of, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but we're not using Comic Sans to make your document look fun. That is not graphic design. So what I want to talk about today is four elements for effective visual communications and how you can use these, uh, these um, techniques to help make your content look cleaner and uh, look well, more well organized and more like something a professional graphic designer would do versus somebody who's not good at graphic design. And even uh, with these tips, although I think they're, they're pretty simple, they are things that take practice um, and they take time to master. And the more, you, um, the more you practice these tips, the more you will become, uh, you'll, you'll develop an eye for graphic design. All right. So the first one I want to talk about is font. And the reason why I talk about font first is because font is usually the easiest thing for us to address. It's the easiest thing to change, and it's it's the one thing that most of us have played around with in some form or another, regardless of what it is that you're creating. But when you're creating a document and you're using fonts, um, you, can, you can very quickly and very easily create something that's really ugly or really distracting. And so the use of fonts is incredibly important because it's usually the first thing somebody notices about a document. Now, in the world of fonts, fonts are just like the animal kingdom. There's a lot of different fonts. Um, and here are, here are some of the um, uh, examples of some of the fonts. And I'm, I need to update this because this is technically not a decorative font. Let me real quickly. I must have lost the font that I was using here, but I'm going to change this to an actual decorative font. We'll do... Uh, We'll do this one. That's more decorative. Okay. Um, but fonts come in four main categories. You have serif, sans serif, script, and decorative. And decorative is kind of the catch-all. Um, but the primary two fonts that you, you're probably more familiar with is serif and sans serif. And what a serif is, is the serif is this little doohickey that comes at the end of the uh, the 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 shape here of the font, or down here at the, the base of the A, or this little embellishment at the end of the C, those are the serifs. And as I'm sure you can imagine, with sans serif, sans means without, and so it's without a serif. And these are those more mo modern fonts. Sans serif fonts are more modern, because they don't include the serif. Script fonts are those like cursive fonts, and then decorative fonts are kind of the catch-all for everything else. Those are those handwritten fonts, or anything that's a little funky. Um, outside of, of your basic fonts. Now, just like, um, and of course it's being a little weird here, give me one moment to fix some of this real quickly. Um, while I'm doing this, let me just explain that sometimes fonts have different personalities in the way that they make people feel. Um, and your fonts can, can communicate a lot about the emotion of a document and what you want people to feel 
when they look at it. And let me change this to a script font. I don't know why it changed away from one. We will do, we'll do this one here. All right. Um, but fonts communicate different emotions. If you think about a serif font, you think tradition, respect, comfort. Um, sans serif communicates stability. It's objective. It's modern. It's masculine. Script fonts are elegant, affectionate, creative, um, whereas decorative fonts can be expressive, friendly, amusing, really whatever it is, you know, depends on what you're doing. And to, just to put this in perspective, you know, if you look at a serif font, um, of course, you know, a bed and breakfast would use a serif font. I can't imagine it using anything but a serif font. Same thing with sans serif. You think about like a men's shampoo or anything that's geared towards a, a, men pro a men's product or a masculine product. It makes sense to have a sans serif font. It, it's just in your head that makes sense to you. Script fonts. Well, of course, if you were doing a wedding invitation, of course you would use a script font. I, why wouldn't you? It's 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 what you expect. And it, and, it, and and your feelings about these things are happening on a subconscious level. Um, you know, there would be something really weird about that that wedding invitation if it was used a sans serif font that was more modern. And decorative fonts. You see these all the time. Decorative fonts are, you know, when they want to make something look organic or natural or handwritten or personalized. And you see this really, really frequently, and it's it's a trend that I'm not seeing all that often, but a couple years ago, uh, you would see this a lot where you would get um, a credit card offer in the mail, right? And it would have, like, that handwritten, like, almost like a handwritten annotation to say, you know, hey, Tim, make sure you do this today, like, as if, as if somebody at Capital One or wherever actually sat down and, and wrote on that envelope or that letter to you. And I've, sadly enough, I've actually sat down and, and looked at, uh, uh, at, those, at those handwritten fonts to see if it really was handwriting. And of course it's not. It's just part of the graphic design, right? So fonts communicate emotion. Here's a really good example. Tropicana, a few years ago, back in the mid-2000s, um, decided to go through a rebranding and you can see their their branding before and after and of course when you think about Tropicana the one on the left is what you imagine and I don't know if anyone rec remembers when Tropicana did this rebranding um, but when they did this the interesting thing happened is it resulted in a 20% sales drop within two months which is huge uh, if you think about that and of course Tropicana immediately reversed course and went back to um, the old the old branding and the old packaging, um, because people couldn't recognize it anymore. And when they couldn't recognize it, they didn't buy it. And, uh, you know, the, the Tropicana, even though it says Tropicana right on the packaging, um, people people don't read. People do things with their eyes, and they pick up what they recognize. So they went back to their old branding uh, uh, to, to, to increase sales again. Here's another great example. Uh, the University of Wisconsin in Green Bay did a study several years ago about different ways to save money or save on printing costs. And what they discovered is, you know, a typical cartridge of ink costs $30, which is a lot. We all know that. But if you translate to that to how much does that cost per gallon, ink is incredibly expensive. It costs over $10,000 a gallon for printer ink, right? And so, and so the University of Wisconsin and Green Bay wanted to figure out, well, how can we reduce the cost of that? And what they discovered is by switching the fonts that they typically used for their print documents, if they switched it to a century gothic font, which happens to be a sans serif font, it uses 30% less ink in printing than the typical Arial setting. And the reason why that is is because century gothic font, it's very, very thin, and it doesn't have those serifs. And just by not having to print that thicker, those thicker lines and those serifs, it saves about 30% ink, which is remarkable. And, and when you add that up in terms of how much money you're saving in ink, it really does add up, right? So fonts are important. Now let me take a moment to talk about Comic Sans because I think we have to address this because it's, it's one that some people abuse without realizing it. So Comic Sans is a font you should never use. Um, and, and here's a great example of, of all sorts of major brands. If you were to switch their logos to Comic Sans, you know, you kind of lose the effect. And the thing about Comic Sans is it's kind of like holding up a sign saying, take me seriously while wearing a, you know, a, a clown nose. Um, so don't use Comic Sans. I just have to point that out. So what do you do when you want to use fonts? Or what are some good uh, rules 
uh, of thumb when using fonts. And, and what I do is I use what's called a three font rule to help me um, create really good looking documentation when I'm using fonts. And it consists of a title, heading, and body font. And so what you choose is you choose three different fonts that are, that are contrasting from one another uh, to create uh, your document. And usually, you know, you start with a title font, and the title font can be something um, that contrasts from your body font or your heading font. And by doing this, you're creating contrast between um, headings and bodies and, and, and by doing that, and titles, and by doing that, it creates a sense of visual hierarchy for your audience to understand what's most important and what's least important. And so you can do this, you can just play around with the fonts uh, that you have installed in your computer, and, and the key is just to choose contrasting fonts of different sizes, different weights, um, and in different styles. And by doing that and figuring out what looks good together and what doesn't look good together, um, you're already you know, starting to move and think like a graphic designer. And you don't have to be able to define what you like or dislike about it. It's just about how it makes you feel. If you like the way they look together, then it probably looks good. If you don't like the way it looks together, it probably looks bad. You don't have to figure out why it looks bad. You just change it, right? Here's another example of the three font rule. Now, a couple of do's and don'ts with fonts. Avoid word art. Word art is something you can do in PowerPoint and Word, but it never turns out what you you know as pretty as you want it to be. So don't use word art. That's so very 1998. <laughs> don't do that. Also, wait, also, I always say stay away from the default fonts. And the default fonts are the Calibris, the Arials, the Comic Sans, the Times New Roman, the Impact. Those, you know, we all recognize those fonts. And, uh, and the reason why I say stay away from them is, A, you know, when you stay with what you're comfortable with, you, you don't think creatively. You have to think outside the box. But also, it, it, kind of, it kind of gets rid of the sense of surprise. You know, there is something on a subconscious level um, about looking at a font you've never seen before. And if it looks really, really nice and pleasant to the eye, um, there's something really special about that. And so, and so stay away from the default fonts. Um, and the last thing I'll say about fonts is if your paragraphs are littered with capitalization, italics, bold text, and underlines, you might want to rethink your approach to your messaging. Excessive emphasis dulls the impact. It's like crying wolf and your readers won't be able to discern what's really important. So again, you know, going back to that poster I showed you earlier, I don't know if I have it here. No, I don't. Um, you know, you, you really want to be discerning about what you're emphasizing on, on your in your content. You know, only bold stuff when it needs to be bolded or capitalized when it needs to be capitalized. But when you do stuff like this, you know, people don't really know what's most important or what's least important. Um, it doesn't create the effect that you think it will. So that's font. So let's talk about layout. Layout's the next important thing, and layout is all about how you lay things out on a screen and its relationship to one another. And layout is all about this balance between hierarchy and white space. And hierarchy is uh, how you define visually what's most important for somebody to look at and what's least important. And white space is the space in between. And we'll talk about each of those individually. And there's a lot of different ways you can create hierarchy. You can create hierarchy by having a contrast in size or shape. You can create hierarchy by the way you shade things or the proximity between two different items or even the color of items. And I'll show you different examples of how you create a sense of visual hierarchy um, just by changing a few simple things. So here's two examples. These are two slides that are exactly the same. They have the exact same content. But you can see here I've, uh, I've changed what has been emphasized with size and proximity and white space. And if you look at the one at the top, you can see the title at the top is bold and large and the bullet points are not as bold and large, and your eyes go straight to that, that main header. Whereas the slide down below, your eyes go straight to those big bullet points, right? And that's, a, that's what I'm talking about with the sense of hierarchy. You are telling the learner or your audience member what should they look at first and what's most important on that slide. And again, we're just using a change in weighting and, and making it bold or large or making it, it, it bigger than the other text. And, and that's what I'm talking about with visual hierarchy. So let me give you an example. Here are two documents. These were documents out of a training manual that I, I was tasked with redesigning. And uh, one of the issues that they were having is people weren't reviewing the content, right? And so they tasked, uh, tasked me to make this look better. 
And uh, the way that I did that is um, I just created a sense of visual hierarchy. And this is these are these two documents have the exact same content. The wording is exactly the same between the two documents. But we created a sense of visual hierarchy to help organize the document. So if you look at the document on the left, and even the one on the right, you know, we start off with some really nice bold headers to help define what is this document about. Job descriptions and performance reviews and the divisional structure. That was not very clear here. Even though that text was there at the top, it, was, it wasn't more important than the rest of the text. And then what we did is I used my three font rule uh, to help organize it. And of course, I created this sense of visual hierarchy by making those headers a little bit larger. So the difference between loss prevention supervisor versus loss prevention officer and how are you doing? You know, it, it creates a sense of organization in that document or a sense of structure. And again, using, you know, how you space it out and how you have it weighted or have the, the body indented. Again, it's creating a sense of visual hierarchy. Same thing with the image on the, the left. Um, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of content, but I did have a header there. And there was some extra space, so I added a graphic to help visually represent what you see there in that document. Just by changing the way the text was spaced and adding some, some variation in the headers and, and the way the font looked and the color of it. Now white space, let's talk about white space because white space is really important. White space is all about giving your audience member or your, your learner breathing room. And this is again something that's occurring very much on a subconscious level. Um, and, and white space is incredibly important in order for your learner to comfortably absorb your content. Um, and white space is this balance between content, imagery, and nothingness. Um, and, and, and having white space or nothingness in your content is incredibly important, uh, more so than you may even realize. And here's an example of, of bad uses of white space. There's actually no white space. Um, you know, you look at the image on the left, and this is a typical ad you might see in a newspaper for a car dealership, right? We've all seen this. And, uh, you know, I don't know, is it is the car is the cars buy one get two or is it 60 percent off or or I also see like 10 percent off or uh, I see I see all these numbers everywhere and I really have no idea what I'm supposed to be looking at. It's overwhelming. And honestly, I don't find it effective. Same thing with the website, uh, the image of a website here on the right. This is a political website and it looks like it's a political website from like 1995. But shockingly, this is a website. There's a date says December 17th, 2009. Um, so this is a website from not that long ago, and it looks awful. Um, you know, where are you even supposed to focus your attention on this website? It's very, very hard to, to uh, digest. Again, these two examples. You know, the poster on the left I've been showing you, one of the biggest things that it, it was, was preventing it from being a successful poster is there's no white space. I felt like I had to fill up every single bit of space on that page and that happens all the time you know whenever you're asked oh can we add an image to that slide just because you know there's nothing there you know well you have to ask yourself does that is it is, am i just filling up space to fill up space or is it is it helping better communicate my message you know you don't want to fill up space just to fill up space so here's a great example uh, here are two you know these are just graphics of documents to help illustrate white space um, you know we could say they have the same content but just by changing, you know, the, the way you space things or the, the, the size you make those items, you can create white space. Um, and, and there's something just inherently uh, easier about the one on the right. There's something inherently easier about the way you, you feel about it and the way you absorb it versus the one on the left that just looks crowded. Um, and, and that's exactly the technique that was being used in this document that I showed you earlier. And the funny thing about this is it's kind of ironic because if you look at the document on the left it technically has more white space if i'm just talking about strictly white space it has tons of white space at the bottom um, versus the one on the right i did fill up the entire page but what's important is it's the white space between the content between the sections of content right and, and that's where um, it's really important to have that important white space is between uh, your content not just filling up half of a page and having a bunch of empty space at the bottom white space versus empty space is really two different things. All right, so that's layout. So let's talk about color. So color is one of those things that people struggle with as well. Um, and, but color is, is one of those things that, just like with font, color has a lot of emotion tied to it. When you think about different colors, uh, 
you know, when you think about a specific color, you, you can almost assign a personality to it, right? And scientifically, uh, colors do have some specific emotions tied to them. Like yellow tends to be optimistic, comforting. Orange is friendly. Red is exciting, youthful. Uh, purple is creative, imaginative, imaginative. Blue is trusting, dependable, strong. Green is peaceful, refreshing, and new. Um, and, and this psychology uh, behind the way we interpret colors is used incredibly strategically within the world of marketing. And let me give you a really, really good example of this. Uh, think about the McDonald's logo. Now, scientifically and, and on a psychological level, red tends to mean urgency, and yellow tends to be associated with hunger. And so, urgent hunger? Do you think there's a relationship between fast food and urgent hunger? I don't know. I find that really interesting. And if you look at a lot of different fast food logos, red and yellow tends to be a very, very common theme you see in a lot of fast food restaurants uh, because it's urgent hunger. That's the emotion behind it, urgent hunger for fast food. I find that really, really interesting, the connection there. So just like with fonts, I use a three-color rule. Um, just like the three font rule, I use a three color rule. And uh, whenever, I, whenever I'm trying to pick out a color scheme or create a color scheme, um, this three color rule tends to work really well for me where you pick a color uh, that tends to be your primary color and, it, and you tend to want to use it 60% of the time versus a secondary color 30% of the time and then an accent color 10% of the time. And you see this, this three color rule being used quite frequently in branding. Um, if we look at, uh, oh, and here's an example, I'm using actually this, this is the color scheme I've been using in this presentation. Um, and you can see here, if we take the three font rule and combine it with the three color rule, you know, and I apply that, again, all of a sudden the, the use of color helps give your, 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 your content additional sense of structure and hierarchy. Um, and here, like I was saying earlier, the three color rule is used in branding all the time. So here's a, a logo. Um, and you can see the three color rule being used there. Here's the Verizon logo, same thing, three color rule being used there. Now, one of the tools I love using for picking colors, because I'll be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not fantastic at picking colors. I'm good at using colors, but not picking them. So I use a website called color.adobe.com, and color.adobe.com is a really great tool that you can use to create color schemes. And you can upload an image, and it'll automatically uh, pick out the color scheme for you and do all sorts of cool stuff. So I love using that tool. It's free. I suggest you check it out. So that's color. Let's talk about the last one, imagery. Imagery is really important, and it's one of those things that we tend to fail at quite frequently, um, either because we're not using good imagery or we're not using imagery that's meaningful. Um, and, and when it comes to imagery, I really break it down into three categories, pictures, diagrams, and charts. So let's talk about pictures first. Pictures, um, the main thing that I think we struggle with with pictures is using not only high quality imagery, but imagery that's part of the same family of images. And, and usually what, what I found is when you look at a series of images, you go, I'm not sure what I don't like about this or something I don't like about it, can't put my thumb on it. What it tends to be is the images, they aren't cohesive with one another. If you look at these three images, they're taken from, you know, they're completely unrelated. They have different exposure levels. Some of them are brighter than others, um, and they're not related, and they're cropped all differently. Um, compared to these three images, there's something about these images that just feels better. They are all cropped the same size, the same aspect ratio. They all have the same lighting, they're the same exposure level, level, and they feel cohesive. And I feel emotionally happy about that. I don't know what it is, but I like it. And uh, and uh, oftentimes it comes down to how you treat your images. And here in this example, you can see I can take images from the same family and I can totally mess them up. So you have to treat your images consistently. Um, you know, if you were to change your images, even if they are from the same family, you have to treat them the same way. You know, when I, when I say treat them, any effects that you apply to them, you want to do that consistently. So compared to this, to this, you know, you can take images that are part of the same image family and, and ruin that, that, that cohesion that's between them. But if you do it consistently, it works. Again, something about this, I feel good about it compared to this, right? Now, the cool thing is you can take images that are not part of the same image family and make them feel like they're part of the same image family, right? Here are those three images from before. They are not part of the same image family, but 
based off the way that I cropped them, based off the way I treated them, making them all black and white, and, and adding a, you know this little reflection, doing, doing stuff like that, it makes them feel more cohesive than they were otherwise, and it feels better than it did before. Now, I used to talk about clip art in this presentation, but I don't talk about it anymore because Microsoft Office got rid of clip art. You can't find clip art anymore. They got rid of that library. So I don't talk about that anymore, unfortunately. All right, so the second one is diagrams. And diagrams are important because diagrams can be used to visually communicate ideas or concepts that you would otherwise put in bullet points or text. And so here you can see this example. We have this text here on the screen. This is from that document I showed you earlier. And, uh, you know, I could have just left that, that, if I'm looking at the one on the right, I could have just left all that text there on the screen and, and not done anything visual, but I had some extra space, and I thought, well, I could create a meaningful graphic here. The important thing is creating a meaningful graphic. And, of course, so I created a, a, a visual graphic or chart or diagram to help illustrate the hierarchy of the organization. And these were just created using basic, basic shapes um, in a PowerPoint or some other simple program to help visually communicate the content that's being talked about in those four paragraphs on the right. Here's another example. Um, I, you know, we wanted a way to visually communicate, talking about personal development, so I created a simple word cloud, right? Uh, with Wordle.net, it's a free program. You can create these word clouds and save them off. And, uh, you know, put that there as a graphic. Again, you could argue, am I just filling up the space to fill it up? Well, I don't know. I, I feel like it's a little bit more of a meaningful graphic um, than just something I would do to fill up the space. Here's another one, you know, trying to help uh, communicate the concept of the 30, 60, 90 day process of starting your new job, right? Visually just communicating that on the piece of paper. Here's another really great example. This is from a presentation that I helped redesign talking about inventory shortage and talking about where shortage occurs within a store. And so one of the things I talked about in this, that was talked about in this presentation is you know, inventory shortage occurs in four different areas, from the vendor to the distribution center to the store to the customer. And I thought, well, there must be a better way to visually communicate this. And so what we ended up doing is we created a diagram to help illustrate this. And again, getting rid of those bullet points to create something that, um, you know, an audience could easily visualize or understand. So at the top, you know, inventory shortage occurs, you know, when stuff is move from the vendor to the distribution center and between the distribution center and the store shortage occurs and between the store and the customer shortage occurs and then back to the DC and back to the vendor so you think about the process of where shortage occurs and that's what the purpose of this this diagram was help that was meant to illustrate compared to those bullet points right and again basic shapes in PowerPoint to create that the last one I'll talk about is charts and charts are all about how you visually communicate data and uh, one of the things I've, I've, I've learned is that you don't need to get rid of your charts. You can keep your charts in your presentations, but you need to simplify them so that they're easy to digest. It's too often that you go into a presentation or you, you, you see something and, and you're presented a chart like this that you can barely even read. And usually the presenter's only talking about a few different cells here within this spreadsheet, um, but they put the entire chart on the screen. And so a couple of rules that I've learned about communicating data, if you're going to put a chart on the screen, is always tell the truth with your data. You always want to be honest with the data. I always have to say that. Number two, you always want to get to the point, right? You want to get to the point of what it is you're talking about. You want to focus on that number or whatever it is, that piece of data. Um, and you want to pick the right tool to do the job. Um, you can use what I'm going to show you, what I use to create these charts. I use, again, basic shapes in PowerPoint. Um, and on, the, on the, the theme of getting to the point, you also want to highlight what's important. You want to make it really, really clear what it is about that data your audience members should be focusing on. And then, of course, with all of that, you want to keep it simple. So I use a simple formula when I'm creating a chart or some data that I want to display. You always start with the background. So you always have some sort of background or diagram or spreadsheet, or in this case, it's going to be a, a, a bar graph. Um, you want to add your data on top of it, then emphasize what's important, and the result is a very, very simple chart. Obviously, this is you know a series of graphics just to help illustrate that, but let me show you some real-life examples. Here's an example of uh, some inventory shortage numbers uh, that was presented, and you can see here these, these numbers go back to 1975 all the way to 2009, but really all we wanted to talk about was the difference between 
um, you know, the, the past couple of years. And so what did I do is I redesigned this presentation to focus on only the last three years. And again, this chart was created using basic text boxes and lines and shapes in PowerPoint. And we focused on what was important, the difference between the actual and goal of inventory shortage in 2010. And that's all we really wanted to focus on. And so that's what we did there. So those are my four elements for effective visual communications. You want to be really good with fonts, with colors, layouts, and of course how you use imagery. Um, but the one thing I'll leave you with before I let you all go for today is you always want to be intentional. If, if when you're designing something, or you're using a font or a graphic or whatever it is you're doing, and you can't figure out why you're doing it, then you really, really need to take a step back to figure that out. Because with anything, you always want to be intentional about your design and figure out what the intention is. So I'll leave you with that. I, I'm happy to stay around for the next eight minutes. Hey, did you like that video? Make sure to check out some of our other great content at elearningandcover.com.